Uh, yeah, so this is our second to last week. Um, we'll, I mean, in theory, I have a lot to go through today, but I think it'll be pretty quick. And again, we've been running long lately, so we'll see. Um, all right, <clears throat> so I'm going to start with the operators section of the reference. Um, and just by the way, today is lots of grab bag. So even within the sections, some of the things are vaguely related. Um, but okay, uh, so there's this, um, the the like replace missing values, replace, replace nulls uh, function operator, whatever. Um, I use this all the time. Either I import this from Arlang, or if I'm not going to import import Arlang in a package, I end up just like uh, rewriting it because it's really super simple. Um, what this does is, if x is null, then it gives you y. Otherwise, it gives you x. And so it's like a way. Um, if you have a default value that is null, you can replace that de default with something. Or if like some calculation might return null, but you want to use a different default, you can use that. Um, I, I just find this super helpful. I've had chains of these where like this might return a null and that might return a null. And I want, you know, I want to go through all of these different checks to see, uh, to find the one that works. So that's that. Um, so the one that I haven't used as much, um, which, uh, well, partly because they say it doesn't really belong here and it'll probably be deprecated, um, is this, the single pipe, which is basically replace NA. Um, but again, it's a much simpler thing to import or just copy, like it's a really simple function. And I do like the, the general idea. So I could imagine um, using this, uh, but I just, I don't know, I haven't, um, but yeah, it is, you know, it's pretty straightforward. It just, you give it some value and it'll replace any NAs with that value, or you can give it uh, like values along the vector and it'll replace with the one in the correct position. Um, yeah, I think you came off mute for a second. Yeah, sorry, John, I, I was just kind of curious, is there, so I, I see them mentioning base if else here, which I guess is the thing that sprang immediately to mind, but this kind of feels like, um, I don't know if this is going to make any sense, like a, a null coalescing operator and like C sharp or something like that. Is it Does no such thing exist within R kind of natively? Like, Correct. Not. Okay. Yeah. And that's like, yeah, it's so it's, um, that's, this is like dplyr coalesce. Um, but there's, you know, that's a whole, you have to get all a dplyr for just this one simple uh, function. And I don't think coalesce actually lets you just give it a default value. And it's written like um, in uh, C. So it's super fast. I forgot that. I was thinking this was one that you could just kind of copy paste, but now you have to actually import it. Um, so yeah, I, I haven't used it. I've used coalesce many times and I've written kind of my own version, but presumably this is nice and fast. So do you know yeah. if there are any easy imports for this? And hearkening back, I guess, to our, our uh, whirlwind tour through use this. Um, <laughs> do you, well, maybe I'll just Google it right now, see if yeah. there's an, a way to bring this on. Cause I, you know, like when you, I think when you have Gollum, yeah. I want to see this is uh, something that, that appears in Gollum uh, out of the bat, but I could be wrong. Um, so, oops, let me see import from, you can do this, oops, I'm going to need the ticks in that case, so come in and chat, make sure I have the right, yeah. Um, I use oh, the it. other one of that all the time, and it'll, that adds all the infrastructure to import it. It does require that you import Arlang, but if you're working with like a lot of packages, then that's all handled. And while I have this open, that's actually what this tab is for. Uh, poking around in here, I noticed they have this unexported one, which is like the double pipe, double pipe checks for null, this pipe zero pipe just checks for empty. And this was something that 
it was like exactly something I needed. <laughs> I was about to write and I was like, okay, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I want. And I, I didn't have a name for it, like, or a, a symbol to use. And so I was like, why don't you export this? Cause I wanted, you know, this, but also I wanted it to work for uh, an empty character vector. Um, in the specific case I was working with. Yeah, so. how would you access that? Because it doesn't really seem like three three dotable, if I can put it that way. <laughs> like how to type it, or or you know, like if if yeah. if you have a if you have kind of like um a non export oh, package, you're saying. package, you can use the three dots well, to access it. Um, you you can do so there are a couple things here. First, you you can always do this, but you know, um don't in a package and actually you can't you can't three dot in a package but um so you, you just have to put the ticks around it when you do the three dots um got it or the way i access it is uh like that <laughs> 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 because it is super simple yeah so uh i, That's I too put bad. a whole like credit of Man, I wish this were exported because I would just import it. But uh, I was about to write this thing, same thing. Didn't have a good name for it, and but I used their naming convention in case it becomes normal. Um, it was like a silly, a silly PR, you know, just like a <laughs> yeah, know, a line of you know, like a, at exports and <laughs> yeah, and document it in the same thing as the null yeah. one because it's you know it's strongly related. You can always you can use this wherever you would use the null version. But it does a little bit more, um, and you know there are different cases where you don't want to replace the um, character or the length zero version. But yeah, I, I found this very helpful or very useful to know about, and it was really funny because I was like about to write it, and then I took a break to work on these uh, to go through these help docs. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> there it is. Um, this next one is this uh, percent at percent to pull a um, attribute off of an uh, an object, like any any object. And it's funny because um, for any kind of objects and they give the examples, I wanna say uh, it also works on S4 objects. And also, by the way, I tested it, it also works on S7 objects because S7 objects are, um, S4 objects. And so it uses the same, like it's able to use the same infrastructure. You don't need it uh, because in S7, it's just X at name uh, without all the spaces and everything, but it's nice that it um, it's universal. And so it's just a way to easily access um, attributes. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the operators. I, I'll, all three of those and really all four of those, including the secret one are pretty useful. Um, they're also, actually, I don't know this one, if this was simple or, cause there's probably lots of um, alternate. Okay, it's not that complicated. So it's just checking if it's an S4, it does a certain thing. Otherwise it uses the attribute. Um, and then yeah, it does the setting, and I at the setting also worked in S seven, which I was uh, impressed. But that's because S seven objects are S so S four objects, so they get caught by this part. Um, and they're also S three objects, so it's fun stuff. All right, so that's the operators, functions. Um, can't remember. Yeah, they don't have a lot in here, but they have these uh, functions for monkeying with functions. Um, so you can create a function programmatically um, given the arguments, the body, and the environment where you want it to be constructed. Um, the most, uh, I don't know, important part on this is that if you want to, so the args can be just a norm, normal named list, but if you want to have arguments that don't have defaults, you have to use pair list or pair list two. And a pair list is a base R thing that is basically just a list that can um, have empty elements. So I'm trying to find a quick, like this X equals and then nothing. Um, that's all, like that's the only special thing about this. Otherwise it's just, it 
uh, creates um, functions. There's uh, not a ton of cases where this makes sense, but you know, if you're doing any um, like metaphor programming where you wanna create a function for people to use, uh, this is the one that lets you do cool things. I, I used this in my um, factory package, which one of these days says you go update because I haven't worked on it in like three years. Um, and I, I just, I know it would be so much better now if I worked on it. So, um, but yeah, if you're trying to construct a, a function programmatically, that's what this is for. Um, this one's actually really useful to know about that as function is what uh, per uses and et cetera. Um, so if you pass in a thing that is a function or formula as function will turn it into a function. Um, it also, it keeps, they put a, a attribute on it that tells it um, that, that lets you know that it was passed in as a one-sided formula. And that's what this is Lambda is checking for is, is it something that was converted into a function from the one-sided formula? Um, nothing super fancy about this other, other than, you know, it lets you write things that act like per does, uh, all that said, now they recommend using the, uh, slash format, the, uh, that format, which was introduced in R 4.1, I think for um, Lambda functions or, or, you know, anonymous functions, which, um, you know, I put it in chat, uh, both for, uh, you, Arthur, and anyone following along at home that realizing that that slash is just the word function made that format, like finally stick in my head. I could not make any sense of this till I realized that if you write, you know, something like that, that's exactly the same as writing just with the word function. Um, so I find that. I think really you've, helpful. you've helped me grok that one too, John. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, like I saw it, I understood it on a level, but that, yeah. Yeah. Backslash, I, backslash I, is function. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, yeah, I couldn't remember, is it parentheses or um, curly braces or what is it? It's like, oh no, it's exactly just replacing like you write any function. So. That was very helpful. I, th I think maybe in the um, Q and A this summer with Hadley, he talked. He, he said he's been using them and um, said something about it. I was like, "Oh my god, yes, okay." So that's when it clicked for me. All right. Um, so they have all these is uh, you know predicate uh, functions to check is, are these things functions or are the things passed in functions. So there's is function which will work it'll return true for any of these things is closure versus is primitive. Um, I didn't realize that that was a difference between like there are uh, primitives don't have the same sort of like environment binding as uh, normal functions. Um, so that's what this difference is. And that'll let you, that can be helpful because primitives don't have um, their arguments don't count as formals. Uh, so they, if you try to get, if you try to use formals on a primitive, it won't tell you what the arguments are, it'll return null. So that's part of the reason to know the difference. And then there are primitives that uh, eagerly evaluate their arguments and they're primitives that uh, don't evaluate their arguments until they need to. The examples they give are like quote and um, substitute don't evaluate their arguments. Um, and so is primitive lazy checks for those ones that don't evaluate the arguments versus is primitive eager checks for the ones that do. Um, I don't have, well, actually I was gonna say, I don't have any uses for this, but I do have a idea hanging out there for um, a like package or an app to make flashcards for uh, packages. And it doesn't work properly on base R because primitives are different. And so being able to identify those would actually be helpful. And so one of these days I'll probably finish that and use this function. 
All right. Next we had, uh, okay. <laughs> it was very funny. So these are all the function formals, function formal names, function formal sims. Um, and then you can set the formals and the names. Immediately before I read these help docs, I was listening to a, it was actually a YouTube video that's going through programming book. And he mentioned that um, arguments are the thing that's like in the definition of the function. Those are arguments. I think I'm, wait, yeah, I think I have this right. Um, no, those, sorry, those are parameters. I, now I'm, I can't remember which way it is, but one is parameters. When you pass it in, it's parameters, I think. And when you define it, it's arguments. That's a formal, uh, that's formal terminology. I might have it backwards. I can't remember for sure. And then formal arguments were like, um, I want to say function arguments are, are the, the base thing. And then formal arguments are parameters. Like, and so it's this extra confusing, um, uh, no, no, uh, programming in program. Um, anyway, it's just, uh, yeah. Okay. So the formal arguments are the ones defined. Uh, okay. That's perfect actually. So they're the placeholders for the actual values that will be passed to the function when it's called. So, uh, that's what, when they talk about formal arguments, that's what they mean. It's the, the placeholders. So when you call a function formals, it returns um, the, uh, the list, and I think it's actually a pair list um, of the argument and the value. So, and yeah, that's why it is a pair list because I think they show some, no, they don't show examples, but if you call something that doesn't have a default value, it'll still have the name there of A, but it won't have a value because you know it didn't have a default. Um, so yeah, that's that's what's going on there. You can get just the names, which is basically it just calls function formals and then gets the names that are uh, in there. Um, the difference between function formals and the base formals function is they throw um, errors when. Uh, there aren't any instead of um, returning null. I don't know that that's necessarily better, uh, but that's the difference. I'm sure that they had a reason that they needed to get an error in that case. Um, so yeah, that's that's all of that. And then yeah, you can set them using this as well. So if you, I, I think I've done this where I monkeyed with a, a function directly. I can't remember why, but. Um, you know, you can make an alternate version of a function that takes different names or something. Um, I don't know for sure where that would be useful, but again, for uh, constructed calls, as they say, if you want to make, like make things, um, let's see. And I did, so they had, they referenced these um, call args and call arg names. Um, so the difference is the call args is like, um, a, a an actual call, like a function that has been invoked and then captured with a quote or something like else like a quote, and it'll tell you what values are being passed in. So instead of the formal arguments, it's the actual arguments um, passed in by the user. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Oh, I did pull up this. Um, <laughs> that that was actually. That's something I need to, or I want to go through and um, pull, put in a pull request because they have this. This is especially useful for forwarding arguments and constructed calls. And if you go to constructed calls, it's this that says, oh, this is deprecated. Use call to and new call instead. And just, you know, they should point to um, call to and new call instead, which I think, uh, yeah. So um, I just thought that was funny, but they, and, and actually there were a fair number of things in here where it's clear that they made tweaks since they wrote the help, but they didn't update the help to exactly match what they've been thinking. So, um, all right. So yeah, I also pulled up this call too. We, we've looked, we've seen it in the metaprogramming section. Um, the general idea is that you can create a call uh, like 
create a quoted function call basically um, from its components. So from the, the function and the uh, dots, which could be the arguments to the call and then a namespace that the function will be in. Um, so yeah, that's uh, can be useful in theory, at least to create, to like put together a, a function call piece by piece between call two and then uh, call modify. And I hope that one's also interesting that that's not a link. Uh, so there are lots of little bugs to fix in these docs. Um, new call was the other one that they mentioned. So this one is, um, it's a different, uh, I can't remember what these stand for, but these are um, computer science abbreviations, C-A-R and C-D-R. Um, so there's the head of the call, so a callable object, and, and then the pair list of arguments. There are the two arguments here versus oops, in call two, it's more, you know, it's the function and then all the arguments spread out in dots. Um, so they're similar, but not quite exactly the same. All right, uh, they have FN body and FN body gets. Um, it's just a wrapper around base body, um, except it does a little bit of, so if you use body from base, it doesn't always put the curly braces around it and FN body always puts the curly braces around it. That's basically the only difference. Um, oh, and it fails on primitives. Um, again, depending what you want to do, that may or may not be a good thing. Uh, something interesting, let's see. Um, yeah, okay. So yeah, you can change like the body and change what the function does. Actually, I used this for, um, I had a hack of, I wanted to use something that I sh thought a package should do, or there was a package that threw an error um, and, and didn't finish what it uh, like, you know, it didn't return the value. It just threw an error. Um, and uh, I needed, I was like, yeah, but your error is wrong. So I wanted to ignore the error. So I actually like loaded the function body and deleted the line with the error and uh, called the version of the function that didn't have that error in it or the error call in it. Um, just while I was waiting for them to fix the thing. So this is a way that you can kind of hack things. Um, I don't know how often I'd recommend actually doing that, but it worked to let me figure out if the thing would work. Uh, function environment is the environment um, of the function. So it's the, the closure, the thing that makes uh, functions in our closures. Uh, it's the place where, like, um, where the function was defined, basically. Um, and then you can change it. So you can, you know, if, if the function was defined with some special value of X, you can change what X is in that environment, for example. Um, mostly comes up when you're doing things with function factories, I think. And then finally, uh, as closure. So this is um, all these things that we've seen for primitives being weird and they don't actually act as closures. As closure, you can give it, you know, a function, but really you're giving it, um, and you know, you can do all of the um, per things. So you can give it a one-sided formula, whatever. But really, what this is for is to give it a, you give it a primitive, and it wraps the primitive in a normal function. Um, again, I don't know how often this would be useful, but uh, it is kind of neat because it like. It makes the arguments. Um, I haven't dug into the code for this of how exactly this works, like what it's doing under the hood, that it's figuring out arguments for you. Uh, it's not always the same set of arguments. Um, E1 and E2 are like the actual arguments of plus. Um, so that's interesting. I I might have to dig into it more at some point, but I. Um, I don't know 
how often this will be useful other than in that flashcard thing, it might be nice to be able to grab the arguments for functions more easily. I'll have to play with that and see if it does help. Any questions or thoughts on all this function insanity before we move on? No, I think I'm good. All right. Attributes. Um, I, I quite like this function set names. It's also in per um, or exported by per. There is a base or well stats uh, version of it. Um, it just, it does some cleaning and some, some like validation. Um, and, oh, you can give it either a, a single, um, like vector of names, or you can like, just give it a bunch of names and it'll put them together into that vector. Um, you can give it a function, which I actually had forgotten about. And then the dots act as arguments to the function. Um, and so, uh, let's see, there's a case in here, uh, like, okay, yeah, you can say that uh, the names are going to be the letters along the vector that comes in, or you can say, uh, or you can capitalize with set names. Um, then, yeah, if, if you give it a function, it takes the existing names as the input to that function, if there are existing names, um, and it, you know, it'll name it based on the values automatically. So if you just say set names, letters, I think they have an example of that. Yeah, set names, letters one to five, it just uses the value as the name. So there are all kinds of little useful things that this thing does. Um, the most, like, you know, you can just use names to set the names, but I, it's easier to use this at the end of a pipe uh, that you can take the thing that is coming out of whatever result and then give it names. Um, so yeah, that's everything about set names. Uh, they have uh, a few names getting functions. So they have names too that will always return a character vector uh, even when there aren't names. And it just gives them the empty string as the names. Um, and if you use it uh, and you're going to be passing in you know, something empty, it'll still use the empty string instead of giving it weird invalid NA names. Sometimes it makes sense to give things NA names, but um, sometimes it doesn't. And so it's just a, an alternative that lets you do some, uh, to get more of what you're expecting at the end of a, um, you know, a, a pipe or something. Um, has name is you give it X and you, um, tell it what name or names you're looking for. Uh, and it'll give you a logical vector to see if it's there. Um, so that's, yeah, has name. Uh, what did I want to look at in this? I don't remember why I pulled this up. Um, this is... Oh, that actually, so that's probably why this is here. This uses in, which, you know, seems straightforward, but there's this package uh, fast match that has uh, F in or fast in. That is, uh, if you're doing something that's going to like repeat, um, in can be really slow and fast match is really fast. And so I actually don't think I would use this version I mean, it depends what I'm doing, but I often just replace anytime I'm going to use in, I use the fast match version of in instead. And so I would rewrite this to do that if I were going to use it for anything production level. Um, but yeah, so that's all there. Uh, you can say, okay, there's is named. Uh, does it have names? Um, and um, are all the names like real? Does it actually have names? Um, and is name two, uh, it's like that, except, um, it, for an empty vector, it returns true. Um, because usually, you know, if you happen to have a length zero, usually that counts 
for whatever you might be doing. Um, and so, yeah, they say is name two goes with names two is named goes with names and then have name is vectorized variant. So do, do any of these have this particular name? Um, so I kind of wish these were named a little bit differently in the sense like uh, it, I mean, if you read the docs, you X, X is a vector. Um, but you know, the has, has name seems to let you, it's a, it's a bit more general. Um, although you're yeah. looking for a specific name, that's the, that's the trade-off, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess this is named would be sort of like, um, uh, you could kind of iterate it over the columns of, let's say a data frame, for example. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, there are lots of different, um, use cases for sure. And so, oh, that was the other one. His named always returns true for empty vectors because they just stopped. So, uh, this whole section of help, it's, you know, we're getting into ones again where I'm like, are we the only ones who have ever read this? Um, although these ones are, I don't know, seem like things that people have probably used. So anyway, this feels like a candidate for, well, I don't know. I, I don't really have a strong grasp on the vectors package, but it seems like this could maybe be moved there. Um, um yeah, yeah, I actually, yes. So this might be in that same, a lot of the stuff we're talking about today actually is in the set of might move into vectors. And actually, was that in, is this sworn? There was one of these. Um, no. Anyway, there's something that says that um, this really belongs in the package fun, which doesn't really exist yet. It's on GitHub and it's like the uh, function equivalent of vectors. And so that's another piece of breaking our lang down that I, I don't remember. It actually might be in one of the things that we still have coming up. But so um, yeah, I think it was one on one that you saw. I remember seeing that that was yeah. Kind of cruising so, alongside yeah yeah so so it'll be interesting to watch that that package hasn't been updated in like a year or more so i don't know if really they're sticking with that i do wonder um if they paused all that stuff because of the s7 um initiative because s7 really feels like it's largely going to replace vectors um so uh <laughs> yeah all right, uh, next they have, so this one seemed so weird and esoteric and I was like, what the heck is this for? Of um, In things you load, there are uh, attributes about where the thing was loaded from. And I was like, okay, like, I guess it's extra noise, but when would you care? And the answer is if you are doing test that or Waldo or this other package carrier that they are working on um, where you want to compare things and you don't want to make them different if they were loaded from a different place. And so that's what they use these for. Um, and then also uh, in this carrier thing, it's for like packaging things up to send them off to another process, things like that. Um, and so you want to get rid of the source references so that you're not sending around all this noise that doesn't really mean anything. And it does it uh, recursively and gets rid of it. So that's that. And in general, um, we're going to see more zap. Like they have a couple of places where they use zap terminology. And um, we'll see other places where that is useful in a moment. All right. Um, they have, all, so again, these are, Probably vectors E or maybe, I don't know, maybe these stay in Arlang because maybe Arlang becomes just like predicates and a few other things, who knows. Um, they have these functions for, does it inherit from a set of classes? So inherits any um, versus inherits all versus inherits only. So if you just do inherits, it just says, is the thing you're looking for in the name or in the list of classes of this object? Any is that, and then all, it has to exactly match all of the things. Uh, and 
only has to have only the one thing. Um, yeah. So, or sorry, only the set of things. So all all could they could still have more classes, but it has to have all of them. Um, yes. And then only test that it's exactly the list that you gave it. Um, that's all. That's pretty straightforward, but it is nice. Like, you know, there are cases where you might want uh, those different ones. Uh, so zap, here we are, these zap objects. Um, it is an explicit uh, thing that you want to delete. So um, it's a sentinel object that indicates that this object, uh, that an object should be removed. Um, you can give it, like you can say names, uh, you want to turn into zaps. And then there's the is zap that you can check if a thing is like set to be zapped. They, they're examples. It's like, okay, yeah, you can use it to, you can make things, but why? So this was one that I went searching. Um, and it was funny because when I went searching, uh, I don't have it handy or, um, oh no, that, never mind. That's a different one, but there's, uh, okay. So this actually wasn't the one I was thinking of. Um, but there's a, there's something where, yeah, yeah. Vectors, uh, has lots of these names to zap. So it, presumably this is what it was written for is, um, you don't say like names to null or names to character zero or whatever. You're explicitly saying, I want to get rid of the names. And so that's what these zaps are for. Um, I think they have, and it's mostly in these uh, names to type of things. Um, I think that was it. I think that's the main, main use case. Um, I can't remember what slider is all about. That's another one that I don't think this is a uh, complete package. Um, yeah, sliding window functions. Um, but I don't like it's not quite on. Oh, it is on CRAN. OK. I guess, yeah, I guess I've used slider. Um, so yeah, slider also has some zapping in it. Um, so. I just I thought that was interesting. Like you totally could just use null, or you know, depending on the use case, things you know, sentinels like null, but they're ambiguous because they might mean that you want a null for whatever case you might be using. Versus zap is saying I want it to be gone. I want to get rid of this thing. So, um, as bytes and parse bytes, like these are the ones that least belong here. Um, a note, a bytes constructor will be exported soon. And if you go to that, it goes over to create vectors, lifecycle questioning that they're going to, uh, get rid of these and they're going to move them into vectors. So, um, they'll probably move, move to vectors at some point. So I think that this is all, you know, it's lies. Do not use them <laughs> because they're not going to finish this. They're going to, if anything, move it to another package. I would think. Um, I also found it interesting that uh, all the memory sizes are base 1000, not 1024. So in some cases, they're also like uh, wrong or depending on how you look at it. So um, anyway, so yeah, that's parse bytes. This whole, this next section, they ha there are a couple of help articles about boxes. And I was like, what? Um, it protects a value by wrapping it, wrapping it in a scalar list rather than by adding an attribute. Um, and then unbox tells you the thing that's inside of the box. Uh, is box says that it is boxed uh, as box. Um, make sure that it's in a box and as box if um, if it matches something. And so I was like, um, okay, what? <laughs> and so you can you know, whatever you as box this boxed and you can put it, um, I, oh, uh, I can't remember what the second argument is there as box doesn't say actually, 
Um, okay, yeah, gives it a special class of my box. So there are all these weird things. Like, okay, again, they're just going to show examples, but not why would you ever want to do this? So I went looking um, and I learned some um, GitHub searching that minus is fork is very important. And I got rid of, you know, uh, Arlang, got rid of this, the CRAN copy of Arlang. This deep in community had a whole bunch of things that were just copies of Arlang um, or copies of Arlang docs. Uh, make sure I'm looking in R and then look for new box. And, uh, you know, again, this is just Arlang. Um, this is a different thing. It's not the same function. Um, this is just our lang. So all of these are just our lang. I'm like, okay, so this is a function that is only used by, like only used to tell you about it, but it's actually used. Oh, so yeah, there's as box, whatever, same, same stuff. Um, I look for as box. There's a little bit here. So Coro is, um, for, uh, like, um, parallel processing and that sort of thing. And so it's a uh, coroutines. They do some, some work of putting things in boxes to identify that it's in the box or, you know, that it's been acted on. Um, I think that's, you know, a lot of this is not, uh, it's just copies of uh, our line. Uh, docs and things like that. So still, we're not getting into a lot of uses of it. But then, um, done. It's like, okay, this is a type of box, a done. You're saying that X is done. Um, and you're putting it in a box and you've got the is done box that's looking for X being done. I'm like, okay, that's starting to more explicitly say what you're using the box for. You're using the box to say that you're done. I thought, oh, okay, this is crazy. Um, and then I'm like, wait, what's this? It's in per? And yes, if you go to um, here, the reduce docs, the reduction terminates early if the function returns a value wrapped in a done. And so I think that's like the only real use, but then you know that opens up all kinds of possible uses that you could have your function that is taking the iterative input um, and uh, if it gets to some certain point, you uh, say, okay, I'm done now. You can wrap your return into done and it'll break out of the reduce before it finishes going through everything. So that's what this is for. Um, I can't remember if they have an example. Uh, Yeah, so yeah, if the result gets to a certain point, you can stop early. I could totally see using this. Um, oh, uh, I'll bet this is used, they have in CLI. Um, CLI doesn't import, I don't think it imports our line, but still this idea is probably used. They, they um, You can stop building a string, basically, that if it's going, if if all the references you make are going to be too wide, they just replace that with dot, dot, dot. So I'll bet you that's part of an example of where you might use done. Um, so I thought that was interesting. That was one of those where I went down this rabbit hole. I'm like, I can't imagine. Oh, okay. I can kind of imagine using that. So it's a good one to know about in case uh, it comes up. All right. And then the last section is the craziest. Like, what the hell is object of weak reference? Uh, is weak ref? I don't know what that means. So, okay. Um, so you can check that. That's interesting. And does anyone do this? Well, Shiny does this. Okay. That's interesting. Um, constructive is a package that it's like um, the base function dput, but it actually makes uh, a constructor. Like so, dput will tell you how to make the object that you put into it. So you can say, you know, dput mt cars, and it returns this string. But um, actually, I'll just show you their help because that explains it real quick. Um, that uh, if you do, yeah, if you do dput iris, it does this structured list, blah blah blah, and it's like, okay, that turns into a data frame when you're all done. Versus construct, 
actually gives you the code that will actually construct it. So nice. Uh, and they use this weak ref stuff. So, okay, it's interesting. What is this for? And then this other, um, just the tester thing that's testing reactive. So that's a copy of uh, Shiny. So it's just Shiny for the most part. So, okay. Um, that. All right, so a weak reference. It's a special R object um, that, um, uh, just to quickly summarize, what it's basically doing is you um, tell it a thing to look at, and if that thing gets deleted, then you have this finalizer argument that your weak reference will go, oh, my the thing I'm connected to is gone now, so now do something. Um, and so it's a reference to it that doesn't stop it from being garbage collected, doesn't stop it from being deleted, which is what the weak reference is about. And this is one of those where I'm like, I don't have an exact use case, but um, like I feel like uh, Wither probably uses the same concept as this. Um, it doesn't actually reference it in any of the code I could find, but it it's the same idea. Um, there's this package later that uh, is, I think, brand newly being worked on, yeah, which does um, schedule something to run after a specified period of time. So that's also kind of interesting. Um, and there's Coro, there's uh, package load does some stuff with this and here's the finalizer idea. Um, and so it's saying, you know, once this thing is done, once this other thing is gone, run something. Um, I didn't dig into it completely in Shiny, but I assume that's uh, there's um, things that happen like at the end of sessions and things like that in Shiny. And so that's probably where it's using these weak references. So it's when the thing's done, um, work with it. So I just thought that was interesting. Uh, so later, yeah, that's that later package. Cause I was like, oh, this is like, uh, Winston Chang and Joe Chang um, does something real and it's not quite Cran yet, but it's being worked on. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and then you can use these wref key and wref value uh, to pull the information out of those weak references. Um, I can't remember. Oh yeah, that's just constructive. But um, again, I don't have a specific use for it yet, but the idea of it seems pretty neat <laughs> um and well time is, is uh no, is new weak ahead. ref sorry uh, really quick is, is, is that the only is that the only way to construct a weak reference is is this like an an object that only our lang can instantiate um i can't remember i how this is yeah so this is it's a c plus plus or a c concept and so they're using it they're doing it under the hood. And yes, there is no way to do this in base R. I mean, there probably are other, um, I mean, you know, you can do it by calling your own C code or things like that, but there's nothing built in. I'm sure this comes from some other like programming concept and it's just not something that really is implemented in R. Uh, but yeah, that's- Interesting. Um, yeah. So there's, yeah, there's weak maps in JavaScript um, but yeah, so, it, and you can use it to keep information. So even without the finalizer idea, you can just like keep, um, some simple like references of the object without having, without preventing the object from being deleted or garbage collected. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, on quit here is uh, when should it be run when R exits? And that's what made me think, oh, this feels a lot like local. Um, as far as I could see in the search, local doesn't use it, but um, it, it must use the same idea. Like it might it must just be a case where they haven't united the two uh, implementations or something. So, so yeah, that on, one was- On quit would oh, be God. like when, when, the, when the R session ends, is that what it means by R exits? Yes, okay. yes. So there's, um, if you do a, a local with with our, um, it, you know, when your R session ends, it undoes or it does runs whatever you want told it to run. So it'll do the um, 
you know, like cleaning up temp files and things like that. Uh, and so you could use this to do something on your system when R quits or whatever. And same with the end, you know, that something would be whatever you set up in the finalizer. Um, like I said, I don't have exact an exact idea of a use for this yet, but it feels like one of those that lets you do um, like higher level things <laughs> that are not normally avail available to you in R. So um, other than, you know, if nothing else, you can use it to like send yourself a message at the end of your session. I have a thing now uh, when my session restarts, I, I have a, a message basically just so I can see that all of my um, our profile has ran and uh, okay, maybe I can give myself a message at the end of my session um, or when things, you know, if you have something that, um, I don't know, I could see it for debugging for figuring out like, okay, at this point, this thing that was being used is no longer available. And so give me a message when that happens. Um, I don't know yet, but that idea feels like something. All right, and so that leaves us with, uh, that was a good transition because next week it's all debugging related things. Um, and then I'll also kind of dig through and see if we miss anything else, but I think that's it. Is the, um, not error handling. Uh, well, it's in error handling, but backtraces. And I think there are a couple of other things uh, that, are left over that are in here for debugging, which again, belong in another package probably, but um, yeah, it would be kind of interesting, I don't know, to, to think a little bit about like, you know, we have talked a couple of times about how our lang is too big and where are the logical lines? I'll, I'll bet we wouldn't come up with the same breakdowns and that's probably why it hasn't broken down yet. <laughs> that well, yeah, these things go apart, except sometimes you need these two things, or often you need these two things in combination. And so if you broke it apart, it would make that more difficult or whatever. So I just think it's interesting to see. But I really do hope they break it apart because it's one I like to import a lot, but I don't want it to get too big to where it feels wasteful to import it. So, Yeah, also it might be the case that if this were split up part hopefully it'd be easier for a person to own the like the smaller smaller scope yeah um well i yeah i think for I'm, users too just having like a mental mo better mental model of what the thing does i think that would be far far easier because mm -hmm. uh, our link just really seems like a giant grab bag of stuff and i feel like it's it's yeah. expanded a I mean, lot over over time i, I mean I, I feel like it's at least for my you know beginner slash intermediate user perspective, it seems like it's gotten a lot better, but still there's just a lot of stuff there. A lot a lot of which I don't need or want, want to use or think about. Um, yeah, well, and especially, you know, just the description here tells you what, two comprehensive frameworks are implemented in Arlang. <laughs> yeah. The, that So you're saying Arlang is at least two packages. <laughs> so, um, and they did, you know, like, they largely split the error stuff off into CLI, but they still use Arlang on top of that. Um, I, I don't know. I can imagine this becoming something like DevTools where, yeah, you can still just use Arlang or you can use all the pieces that Arlang, it, you know, Arlang is really just re-exporting from all these other fun, uh, packages. Um, yeah, that would make sense. Make so, it like a, me a meta a meta package, but kind of more, yeah. more meta package in the sense that it, it kind of loads other packages, then it, it just has everything inside. Right, right. Because in a lot of cases, I can imagine only wanting the error messaging stuff. Um, and, it, you know, I, I'm sure part of it is that under the hood, they're all using the same infrastructure. But so maybe all the unexported functions from Arlang need to become a package uh, that is used by the other packages. So it's interesting. And I, I don't know, I'm curious if they have any thoughts on that, plans for that. Uh, I am taking 
Adley's uh, package workshop. So maybe I will ask him about that. Because <laughs> I, I don't, I like to import it. Like I like to use it in a lot of cases, but I am rarely using the tidy eval parts in these packages that I'm using it in. And that feels pretty wasteful because that's a whole giant section of the package that if I'm not doing things with the tidyverse, I don't need any of that stuff um, for the most yeah, part. Just just the so. opposite for me. I'm, I'm using the yeah. tidy yep. eval and not, not much else. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Um, I, I do like the uh, like bang, bang, bang. I, I will use inject um, now that I've learned about it instead of like do call just because it's easier to write. Um, so I don't know. And like I say, like the, if you're using that, then all the tidy eval stuff kind of goes with that. So anyway, um, yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. And I forgot, this is just one of the sections is the two frameworks. And then there's argument intake and programming interfaces. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, these, and that still doesn't seem way, like a comprehensive all. overview, right? Um, yeah, and then very, you know, occasionally I'll use some of the funky, funky stuff here, but pretty sure all of this stuff is just it's used by the stuff above it is why it's also in here. Um, and okay, I use inject initially. Um, and I don't know, maybe as I uh, level up my uh, package writing game, I'll use more of our lang. And maybe that's why they keep it together is they use all of it in every package they write. I don't know. Mm, um, that's a good reason. Yeah. <laughs> so I could see that. Anyway, all right. Uh, so yeah, we have that one one piece and that will be it. Um, awesome. All right. Well, thank you again, you John, for, for walking and walking us through this. <laughs> this has been hugely helpful. I've been meaning to say I was going to read through the docs of Arlang for a very long time and mm -hmm. didn't have the commitment device. I, like this has been on the list since the advanced R book club back in spring of 2020. Uh, as we went through that, it was like, oh, you know, what else is in Arlang? And that'd be interesting to find out. And I'm glad we waited because a lot has changed. <laughs> but uh I'm glad to have done it too. And so now I guess I need to uh, put a watch on GitHub for Arlang so that I know what has changed. Um, now that we know everything that's in here, we might have to do that. Anyway, I will see you next week. See you next week. <laughs>